The ECOSI Foundation is a non-profit development arm of the EcoStore Sustainable Lifestyle Retail Store brand. ECOSI Foundation means ECO empowering communities with hope and opportunities through sustainable initiatives, a foundation that is focused on up-leveling products of community-based women all over the country. Our developmental directions include being able to strengthen social and cultural community enterprises, helping women's economic empowerment, as well as being able to focus on culture, design, and aesthetics as central to development. Under the ECOSI Foundation, we have two main development programs, which are the ECO Design Lab and the ECO Teach. ECO Design Lab is what we are discussing in this training video. First and foremost is a development program of women communities and various other communities all over the country, including those of our cultural indigenous peoples. We realize that a lot of our products need to be able to be brought to markets that are more than just in the grocery stores. And therefore, we must develop and up-level community-based products towards markets that are niche, specialty, as well as global markets. Echo Teach is the program that focuses on how to strengthen enterprises to become more sustainable. These are things that include financial literacy, uh, project management, and social enterprise development, and other business and development services that can help bring the, mark bring the products into higher and better markets. What should women entrepreneurs know about their products? First, you have to know if you are differentiated, if you have something different to offer, if you have something more to offer than the products available in the market already. You must also know uh, what, who is your target market. When you come up with a product, you don't only fill a need, you are serving a particular market. Not everyone can be everything uh, to everyone. So you must, you can choose a specific market or you can choose mass market. So we're talking about two kinds of markets. What are the different types of markets? One is the mass market or what we call the fast moving consumer goods things you find in the supermarket, in the grocery, and commodities. Commodities do not necessarily have your name on it. Commodities are products that can be brought to market by anyone. Now let's talk about specialty markets. What are specialty markets? If a commodity adds value or has an added value, then you can gear it for the specialty market. An example would be rice. Rice is an everyday product. But if you're selling organic rice or brown rice, red rice, then this is different from the usual commodity, which is just ordinary rice. We can also talk about sugar. Sugar can be regular sugar or it can be coconut sugar, it can be uh, brown sugar, or natural sugar. So there are many ways to approach the market, and the first thing would be to define or identify what differentiates your product. Niche and specialty markets. This is a market that will understand why something that can be bought as a commodity is now being sold for a higher price. And what could be the reason for that higher price? A specialty market will understand fair trade or ensuring that farmers get equitably paid for their produce. Second way that you can find a niche market is it's a particular segment that understands a certain health concern, for example, like organic or natural. These are specialty markets that have not yet gone mainstream and would pay a premium 
if a product is natural or organic. Even if a product does not have organic certification yet, it could be uh, organically grown or with a certification in process. What kind of buyers do you have in the specialty market? Buyers in the specialty market understand that products are not only sold for pure function, but products are sold because they help a certain cause. Products are sold because they have not only their innate qualities, but they have values added to them that could be invisible to the eye, but these are perceived through uh, certifications, through traceability, and if the product is a sustainable product. How do we break into specialty markets? One is to try and sample your products in that particular segment in probably an event, an affair, or in a specialty store. Specialty markets need to taste or sample your product or try it on their skin if it's cosmetic. They need to try it as a sample to be convinced. Specialty markets do not believe just in advertising or in just testimonials, but they have to sample the food, sample the drink, or test the product themselves. In the specialty market, and especially fashion, design is key. Aside from design, what the community can bring is good skills that show a very uh, metho methodically done and beautifully, intricately done handiwork, which is a skill. But let us leave the design aspect to our fashion designers, to our home designers, because they are the ones who know the international trends. When we begin to do product development in each community, we tell everyone to see what do you have around you that is uniquely yours. You have to see this as a differentiator in that we cannot continually develop products that everybody else is doing or we take ourselves out of the market. What makes us different when we come into markets is that there is something in our products that is something unique, either about our own area, our community, the environment around which we are in. And so we need to be able to see how do we create specific products that are, for example, found from fruits and or materials around the area, specific to the area. The challenge for communities sometimes is that they must be able to mix together just not only the natural material, but also the livelihood skills. And this is where we come in to be able to help them develop up level up-leveling meaning into other markets that can give them bigger and much higher profit. Products are either food or non-food. Under the non-food category, we have everything from accessories, uh, fashion items, um, home decor, even um, items that can be used in uh, daily life, which are the lifestyle items. So there are two clear categories in how we do product development specific to these two different groups. For the non-food area, and specifically for fashion, a lot of our community people want to be able to create products that they can use and sell to make fashionistas or make fashion part of life and their own markets. However, what we have found out is that fashion is a fickle, fickle industry. And we suggest to our community uh, groups Maybe we should focus more on trying to find the best natural products and the most basic uses for the home. For people who weave, we can look at a lot of uh, home, air, uh, home products, for example, such as placemats, uh, covers of uh, furniture, uh, pillowcases, rather than move into bags. Everybody wants to create a bag. However, the market for bags are already saturated and also Fashion, as I mentioned earlier, is very fickle. In the international scene, as well as the national scene, the changes of fashion move almost every three months, every six months, it changes. So our suggestion for the community uh, uh, developers of products is that we focus on the skill and the material when it comes to fashion, and then we will bring in the designers to help you create designs 
for the markets abroad or even nationally. We realize we cannot do everything alone and ourselves. This is why we must work together with the people who know design. In the specialty market, and especially fashion, design is key. Aside from design, what the community can bring is good skills that show a very uh, metho methodically done and beautifully, intricately done handiwork, which is a skill. But let us leave the design aspect to our fashion designers, to our home designers, because they are the ones who know the international trends. There are other non-food items that are functional. For example, you have bags that could be sold for functional daily use and not on a fashion level. What I'm trying to show here is that there will always be two different kinds of markets that you can create products for. When we begin to look at the higher end specialty market, we can ask a chef to come in and design or create a new vinegar for that much higher designer chef uh, product. Product variants. Product variants are different presentations of the same product. For example, rice. Rice can be uh, have variants in different colors, red, brown, pink, black. Or rice can be by origin. It can be rice from Banawe. It can be rice from the Visayas. It can be rice from Davao. So variants are, uh, you know, selections that the consumer, you know, in this day and age, people want choices. So variants will most likely help you get to the consumer in this world of many choices. You cannot stick to just one product. Rather, you must have the product wearing different clothes or wearing different colors or appealing to different senses of the consumer. Do not think that you're only limited to a grocery market, for example, when it comes to a food product. Let us take the example of vinegar. Vinegar can be sold in the grocery store, it can be sold in your market, and your profit level is this small. When we bring vinegar to a specialty market, we will now begin to romance the story of this vinegar. We will begin to add on ingredients such as herbs, uh, different kinds of maybe pepper and chilies, and the vinegar has a different variant, a different flavor is created. Then we tell the story of this unique vinegar coming from coconuts, specifically put together by the different uh, communities, for example, in Quezon. And then the story of the communities add on to the different variant now of this coconut, which becomes something we can sell in a deli and not anymore in the grocery. So you see, some products can be, and always we should think of it this way, create variants for different markets. Why is it important to tell the story about your product? Because your product cannot speak for itself unless you put a label or a story of its origins, of what makes it special. Otherwise, it'll just be like soap. Soap can be anything that cleans the body or cleans clothes. But once you tell the story that the soap is made by a certain group, by a certain community, for a certain cause, then if your price difference is, say, 10 or 20% from commodities, then people will say, I will buy this soap. And that's why you have these differentials or this premium, because people who understand stories will pay to be told that story. Now, for non-fashion trends, or rather non-fashion items such as home accessories, uh, things that we can beautify the home, let us think of the urban market. Now, this is a market that's very stressed. The people are busy. They have no more time. Everything is going so fast, which means colors must be quiet. The signs must be simple. Material, more often than not, is natural. Why? The new trend called Zen or minimalist is something that the urban cities like because this is what 
relaxes them. After a day in, in a hectic world, they want to go home to a place that is peaceful, where the colors are not jarring, where there's not too many prints, where the lines are simple and everything is just quiet. And this is where we try to share uh, when we come with our community groups that sometimes it's very hard to have a, a, a beautiful um, placemat which is full of prints because most of the homes in the urban cities especially now that it is very expensive to have different homes in the cities little condominiums have little space and therefore you must make the space look big so less prints more solid colors more muted colors colors of the earth that you want to bring in so that it is healing like for example browns and blacks greens and grays these are the quiet colors that urban or city people like in their condominiums and their homes it is very different from the uh, ways in the province where there's a lot of space and you can have all the prints and all the colors but we suggest to use natural materials with very minimal design and streamlined forms and colors how to develop a product especially if it's a food item we must always consider food trends yearly there is always a trend for flavors like um, right now the new trend is all about organic natural healthy so when we develop products we must always test the sweetness level is it good for people who are sugar sensitive who are sugar intolerant are they diabetic will do you have a market who's going to consume your products if it's too sweet so we must always watch out for food trends that are coming out in a yearly basis and then we also have to consider is the market growing for natural products? So we must also find out what ingredients do we put inside the product? Is it healthy? Is it um, a lot chemical based? Do we put MSG inside it? Because a lot of people now want to uh, buy products, though they're shorter shelf life, they're always fresh. Some of our communities we work with are cultural indigenous communities or what we call the IPs. Skills, handicrafts are often handed down through generations and it is very difficult for them to change because there is a unique ethos or a unique kind of a design specific to that cultural indigenous community. For example, the Tiboli have been weaving since they began pre-colonial times similar kinds of patterns that come from the dream time or from the way they, uh, their ancestors have brought down these um, designs. This has a different level when we look at product design. It is very difficult nowadays for the urban and the city people to understand that there is meaning in the way our indigenous peoples come up with their products or their uh, beautiful textiles and different kinds of functional pieces. So what we often say to the indigenous peoples whose groups we help develop products for, let us keep the kind of level of our traditional crafts excellence, and that is much higher in price. However, we can develop lifestyle products that are for a cheaper market or for a, a more mainstream local market without making it look too ethnic. We need to find that balance in each of the communities or our communities themselves will not be sustainable. Sometimes an indigenous woman would weave a cloth for three months and that is all that she will do. How will she feed her family? We need to see how can this cloth slowly be translated into other products that she can sell quickly while keeping a level of weaving that continues the meaning of her people. So these are challenges in packaging design where we must be able to keep in mind as we work with you in the communities. Design must come from culture. We cannot forget the different kinds of meaning of our culture. So first and foremost, when you are in your area or community, begin to see what is unique there. If there is a specific uh, um, cake or a uh, kakanin that has a meaning or a certain tuba or something, find that story because that is what is going to make it unique in the market. 
What are the different kinds of certifications or stamps that people or consumers are familiar with? Especially with food products, we look at GMP, HACCP, and for organic, it could be a local certifier like the OCCP or international organizations that give international organic certifications. JAS in Japan, we have Naturland in Germany, BIO, BIO, and the USDA. Depending on the market that we want to serve, we must make sure that our products can comply with these certifying bodies. How do we know how to cost or price our product? First, let's look at cost. When we cost product, we take all the ingredients that we use and consider that as our material cost. So we take all the ingredients that we use and take that as the materials. Then we take the labor. How much time did we spend on making a particular batch of products? For labor, we compute what an equitable fair wage is in the community where this product is made. We divide it by regular man hours of eight hours per day. And we compute how much time we spend in the creation of the product from preparation until it's finished. Labor and materials fall into what we call direct cost. But after direct cost, we have to compute electricity, water, all the things that we don't account for in the direct cost. And we call this factory overhead. Even if it's in your house, there is still such a thing as overhead. You have to pay for water and lights and additional help, if any, delivery costs. And you put this under overhead, which can be a certain percentage of the cost of ingredients and labor. So we come to that and we add it all up and it becomes our production cost. How do we price? It can be a production cost times a certain percentage or we look at a certain competitive product in the market and see what market is willing to pay for this product. There's no hard and fast rule on how to price your product. It really all depends on the markets where you want to sell. And we must also think of the distribution channels. After it leaves our factory, it can go through several distributors before it gets to the consumer. Each distribution channel must get a certain percentage of the retail price. So when we think of pricing our product, we think not only of production cost, we think of market price and everything that happens in between. There's such a thing as perception pricing, where people unconsciously are willing to pay for something just because they think it's acceptable. That is perception pricing. So it's not necessarily a function of cost, but it's more a function of market. Market acceptance, if the market thinks that a bottle of jam should be uh, 100 pesos or $2, then that is the perceived acceptable price in the market. And you can play between your cost and the perceived acceptable market price. In product creation, we must always think of the market. We should not only think of what we like to do or what we can make. Rather, what we want is to teach communities to look at what the market needs, what the market wants. So we must always be market-driven. Secondly, we must look at what we have in the community, what natural resources we have, what skills we have in the community. Otherwise, we will end up having to import or having to get ingredients or products from different places, and this will add to our cost. So we always think of local, but thinking global, and thinking of what not only our local market, but the international market and what products 
we can create for them. Very basic in labeling food products are ingredients, and there's the ingredient labeling law, the weight, the volume, and the basic inherent description of the product should be stated on the label. I think first and foremost, um, you must have the ingredients. And then aside from the ingredients, instructions on how to use it. The, product, the producer's name or manufacturer's name. Shelf life is very important. If the community has BFAD, and then the BFAD number must be placed, especially if you want to target mainstream markets in uh, major cities, or also if you're targeting uh, in the international market. Aside from that, you should also put nutritional facts if it's available or if you must plan to be able to put it in your label someday. When we package a product, we must think what goes into the product that we're selling. If it's a liquid, it's always safe to put it in bottles. Um, glass bottle will be the number one priority because it's recyclable. The next would be plastic bottles. But as, as we put it in plastic bottles, we must also consider handling. So. If it's food that can, that's perishable, we must be able to secure it with a seal. The next thing is if it's a dry product, then we have to look for the best grade of plastic to put it inside, especially if it's moisture sensitive. And then we also have to think of the shelf life. The thicker the plastic, the longer the shelf life. Um, handling. From the producers, it goes through several distribution handling. So by the time it gets to the shelf, store shelf, it actually has been handled over 10 times, even 20 times. So how will the product withstand all the handling? Will it look crumpled by the time it gets to the shelf? Will it still look as it was when it was first made? So the product material, the material you use in packaging is very important so that the product will look as new as it was first made. We can also bundle products and put them together and they become very, very nice corporate or um, office gifts. For this case, as an example, we bundled up all products that are mango based and put them together and of course, we even gave them a very nice card, a card which depicts the painting of Fernando Ambrosolo. And this is a painting sh showing the mango harvest. Inspired by that card, we're able to put together several products that are mango-based. We have the mango jam. We have the, uh, would you believe, mango ketchup. And then we have the dried mangoes at the back. And of course, we have candies for children. And then, of course, the mango-flavored marshmallow. A local community can also take advantage of putting together products in their municipality and putting together them in one basket and presenting them this way.